half of all Canadians say they've tried it. Four million of us admit to more than the occasional toke. But even if you wouldn't be caught dead at Vancouver's annual smoking, marijuana deserves your attention. Like it or not, cannabis is one of our most valuable resources. It's bigger than prairie wheat, with larger exports than fishing, and more workers than mining and forestry combined. Illegal and unregulated, Canada's marijuana industry is worth a staggering $20 billion a year. From outdoor grow-ups on Crown land, to mortgage helpers in city basements, to industrial operations in abandoned factories. Canadians from coast to coast are discovering their green thumbs. Not long ago, marijuana was a safe and quiet cottage industry. Not anymore. Police search warrant, come to the door! Today, the business has erupted in chaos. Huge profits are a magnet for organized crime, and rival street gangs battle over market share. If you've got like a half a million dollars rolling down the highway, you're packing heat. In the last year, we've seen people shot to death over the marijuana trade. Five hundred kilometers east of Vancouver, Grand Forks seems far removed from the world of gangland violence. Yet this idyllic border town lies in the heartland of Canada's marijuana industry. Morning, guys. Hey. Behind the facade of tidy homes on pleasant streets hides a secret economy. Police believe one house in 10 contains a grow up. With a population of just 4,000, the area is thought to support some 300 commercial growers. It's early spring, and Taylor is planting his first crop deep in the woods on the edge of town. With lots of accessible crown land, a mild climate, and neighbors who know the value of minding their own business, this is marijuana paradise. Taylor has no compunctions about getting into the business. I'm not doing anything wrong here. Growing tomatoes as far as anyone else is concerned. There's a lot of pot growers here. Big business. His strategy is to stay under the radar, scattering a few dozen plants in discreet clusters. But if he's lucky enough to have a bumper crop, his modest grow up could bring him $50,000 in the fall. <sighs> then there's Brian McAndrew. He's been growing weed for nearly 35 years. This is where it happens the budding. A graphic artist by trade. His commercial work has been hit hard by the recession. Brian and his girlfriend Tammy top up the household income growing a strain of marijuana called Shady Lady. Well, with, with our system here with these 25 plants, uh, the way they're grown, we should be getting uh, six to eight pounds. Your gross w wages off this, you're getting between 12 and $15,000. Office? Yes. <laughs> Even the president of the Chamber of Commerce grows the stuff. Brian Taylor is one of the founders of BC's Marijuana Party. This is diesel. It's a very aromatic pot. A cancer survivor, he grows for medicinal purposes, legally. Brian is one of just 2,000 Canadians licensed by Health Canada to produce medical marijuana. This is going to uh, a patient in New Brunswick. I ship it to him when it's processed and ready by Canada Post. Signature required. And the good folks of Grand Forks take it all in stride. 
All right, I'm Greg. I'm Les. We're from whatsupgf.com. We're here talking to people on the street today about a sticky subject called marijuana. I work in a coffee shop, so I mean, if people were smoking a lot of marijuana, then they'd want to come in and buy our muffins and stuff. Marijuana is a medicine, and it makes a lot of people feel very good. First of all, I don't like the smell of it. Secondly, I don't want it around. For me, it, it's, it's absolutely disgusting. It's a way of life here. Whatever their point of view, few dispute that the local economy is hooked on marijuana. In a town like Grand Forks, you're probably looking at between 20 and 40 percent of the money in the local community coming from marijuana. It's not put in the bank, because that's how they catch you. It's spent as fast as you make it. It wasn't always this way. Like so many other lumber towns in the BC interior, Grand Forks fell on hard times when the mills closed. So in a time-honored tradition, a different kind of seedling was planted. In times of economic crisis, people always revert to marijuana growing because it's fast and immediate. What did you do for it? You put seeds in shit and added water, and you waited four months. And then they take that product and they go and burn it. They go and burn it so that they need to come back four months later and buy more. BC Bud is the world's most potent marijuana, a hybrid of two different strains, indica and sativa. The plants are grown to produce bud with over 20% THC, the chemical that gets you high. If you put a lot of energy into these, then you can get up to $1,000 per plant. But outdoor growing is a risky business, with bugs, weather, thieves, and cops a constant threat. 85% of Canadian marijuana is grown indoors. Okay, right this way. And watch your steps through the stairway here, it's narrow. The marijuana industry has been transformed by a revolution in technology. Dave has invested in the most advanced, user-friendly system on the market. A $3,000 kit that can transform any spare bedroom into a cannabis factory. It's a high-pressure spray. It's spraying onto the root system, very fine mist, and it allows the roots to uh, get as much oxygen as possible mixed in with the food and nutrients as well. And it creates phenomenal growth. This is the leading edge, pretty much. For 20 minutes of work each day, Dave's discreet little operation can bring in $100,000 a year. Small wonder that some 20,000 British Columbians now grow marijuana. Out of sight, off the books, they generate close to 5% of the provincial GDP. And it's in BC that the roots of Canada's marijuana industry can be found. Back in the 60s, the Kootenays were fertile ground for the hippies and draft dodgers who first started growing BC bud. Dukabors from Russia were already growing hemp, a different strain of cannabis that doesn't get you high. These pacifist farmers used hemp for making fabric, rope, and oil. Their culture resonated with the marijuana pioneers. Brian Taylor became an activist for marijuana in the 1980s. When he came to town 10 years later, he found a community sympathetic to his cause. When I got to Grand Forks here, I was invigorated that this was the, uh, this was the direction my life was going to go. I was going to make a difference. After helping local farmers start a hemp co-op, Brian was a popular man in town. He ran for mayor and won. But then he admitted on a radio talk show that he enjoyed a joint now and then. The whole world changed for me at that point. I became the only standing elected official that was smoking marijuana, not had smoked it or was going to or remembered doing it. I was a smoker. Grand Forks was suddenly infamous as the town with the marijuana mayor. And Brian Taylor became a pariah. Well, I stepped up to that mic. So the lead singer for Buck Naked and the Saddle Tramps would lose the next election. And the next. And the next. And the next.
The house up the hill from the ex-mayor belongs to RCMP Constable Harland Venema. His is not an easy job. Bye, I love you. See you later. We got the growers, we got the traffickers, the smugglers, the medicinal advocates, the, the growers for the cause, the hippies. It's all here in Grand Forks. Brian and Harlan have been good neighbors for years. Growing up in a conservative Christian household in Winnipeg, Harlan had little exposure to pot. As far as marijuana was concerned, well, it was all lumped in with everything else. It was, uh, it was an evil drug. And that was the end of it. I never really gave it much thought. I never saw weed till I got to British Columbia. But after five years on the beat in Grand Forks, he can smell it from a moving car. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> what was that? We just... I don't know. It smelled like something. The whiff isn't big enough for a warrant, but a week ago, he busted a quarter million dollar operation in a farmhouse. That's what we're talking about from this most recent one. 40 lights, it was the whole house and the whole barn. Each one of these bags is worth $10,000. That kind of money needs protection. This one was, uh, had a round in the chamber, safety was off, and it was sitting beside the uh, front door of the house as we were going in. Got a nice 38 special here, a guy had in his fanny pack when we busted him. This is disheartening for small town British Columbia. This is just stupidity that this has to come into the picture. The guns aren't just in case of a police raid. In recent years, armed gangs known as rippers have been robbing grow ups. Illegal growers are easy prey because a call to police would put them out of business. The rippers just go in, kick down the door, and take the profit. Everything goes wrong during periods of prohibition. The more it's made illegal, the more the prices go up, the more violence caused, the more, the more we enforce the drug wars, the more we get all these problems. The peaceful days of mom and pop operations are almost gone. Today, guns, gangs, and grow ops are found right across the country. With the kinds of technologies we now have for hydroponic, with the nutrients, with the sun lamps, you can grow marijuana anywhere, and, and that's why this industry has spread across Canada and around the world. An industry that started in BC has steadily expanded eastward, finding new growers and hungry markets. In 2004, Ontario Provincial Police raided the former Molson Brewery in Barrie and found 30,000 plants worth $30 million, the largest bust in Canadian history. In every city across the land, the marijuana business is booming. I think the problem in the last three or four years has almost increased tenfold. This is an everyday occurrence in Toronto, everyday occurrence in York almost. As the police get more diligent, grow ops become more sophisticated. Near Chilliwack, just east of Vancouver, a Quonset hut contains an elevator leading to a massive underground bunker. You can see here that we've got three tiers of uh, marijuana plants with over 10,000 plants of growing marijuana. With 50,000 Canadians charged with possession every year, the annual cost to police and prosecute the marijuana business is one and a half billion dollars. An economic study by the Fraser Institute concludes that prohibition effectively transfers billions of dollars to organized crime. The study recommends marijuana be treated like any other restricted commodity. If it was going to be regulated, say, the way it's reg we regulate tobacco and uh, it, would, it would just be on a tax basis, if we regulated it the way we regulated alcohol, it might be still sold at state stores. And I'm sure the government would, would be glad to take the revenue from, from that activity. Here's the two big winners in the marijuana industry, organized crime and their lawyers. Who are the big losers? Taxpayers. 
In California, business and sales taxes charged on medical marijuana sold through legal dispensaries bring $20 million into the public purse every year. Half ounce granddaddy, half ounce dragon's breath. But the government of Canada is having none of it. Uh, with respect to decriminalizing small amounts of marijuana, this will never happen under a conservative administration. We have no intention to do that. With no change in sight on the legal horizon, back in Grand Forks, it's business as usual. Two weeks into the growing season, Taylor returns to check his plants. So they shot up really quick. They have a little bit of infestation. I have a spider in my ear, too. This is a bad news. One of these means many. As soon as you have many, they spread to all your plants, and they're all wiped out. Harland is once again out on patrol, looking for growers tending their crops. We're heading up the uh, North Fork Valley. I guess uh, if you could put an analogy to it, you know, you go fishing where the fish are. I mean, I kind of like to focus my attention on the, uh, the bigger guys, and, and if I run out of bigger guys, then I'll, I guess I'll move down the chain. He's called to the nearby town of Midway to help officers from another detachment bust an outdoor grow up. We don't know if he's there right now. Plus, we're going into an area where these guys could be hiding out anywhere. I'm watching us. I'm waiting. Yeah. Sure. All right. Sweet. Officer safety number one, obviously. Yeah. Acting on aerial reconnaissance, the RCMP team moves into the bush, hoping to catch the growers on site. By the time they arrive, the growers have fled, likely tipped off by someone monitoring police radios. They were living on site, and they had uh, basically barbed wire around the whole perimeter here. The mission switches to destroying the crop. 250 plants worth a quarter million dollars. Even when growers are caught, most marijuana charges are dismissed on technicalities or reduced in plea bargaining. Of the few cases that do make it to trial, only one in 10 leads to jail time. Just in case anybody has any questions. I have no illusions that we're, uh, you know, destroying the marijuana industry in British Columbia. I mean, I think it's still thriving pretty strong, even with the successes that we've had. So where does all the marijuana go? Next, an inside look at the multi-billion dollar export market for marijuana. BC Bud marijuana coming out of Canada is, is the largest narcotic threat we have. After 10 weeks of growing in his cutting-edge hydroponic system, Dave's marijuana is ready to roll. It's a little lighter than I would have anticipated, but all that it came out pretty, pretty decent. It's perfect BC bud. Clean, organic, and potent. After trimming, he'll put some aside for himself and his friends, then package the rest in half-pound bags for market. Dave is proud to show off his bud for the camera, but he's tight-lipped about where it's going and who's buying. Pot moves across the country just like peaches or potatoes, driven by supply and demand. If you had a big truck with a ma mass amount of marijuana and you wanted to sell it, what you would begin to do is you'd go north. The man in Edmonton and Fort McMurray is always huge because wherever you've got oil and gas workers, you've got a lot of men, you've got lots of money. There's not much to sell in Winnipeg. Manitoba is self-sufficient. And in fact, they tend to ship it down to North and South Dakota. And then when you get to Ontario, because the economy is so poor now, there's less people buying it, and there's more people producing it. And in Quebec, their market almost exclusively goes to the Northeastern United States. The most expensive place in Canada for pot is St. John's, Newfoundland. It's $20 a gram, but marijuana is very scarce there. With Grand Forks perched right on the 49th latitude, it's no surprise that local growers have long been in the export business. 
In the old days, smugglers followed trails up on Phoenix Mountain, originally made by rum runners in the 1920s. This is the border. That's the big swath that they cut for uh, enduring prohibition to make work for men. And uh, that's all there is in terms of security, a barbed wire fence and a whole bunch of wilderness both ways. This has certainly been a popular place to cross over in, in the past. You can see there's not much of an impediment to just walking right over there. For years, it was so-called ground pounders like Mel Bell who did the heavy lifting. They were paid $300 a pound to carry marijuana across the border in hockey bags. I guess it's just like espionage, going into the enemy camp and making sure you can get in and out without being seen or found. All your senses are attuned, time stops, and you go through that window. And then it takes about two weeks just to de-stress after that. What was once proudly called the longest undefended border in the world isn't anymore. Today, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security scours the boundary night and day with surveillance cameras, ground sensors, and unmanned aerial drones. That has been lingering in the area of... I happen to believe 9-11 was a kind of watershed uh, for the marijuana industry in Canada because of the nexus that uh, the Bush administration was able to draw between drug trafficking and terrorism. With tighter security on both sides of the 49th, exporting BC Bud entails new levels of risk. One man familiar with the challenges is Patty Roberts, who's flown this stretch of the border many times. Ten years ago, he was charged with being part of a smuggling ring that flew thousands of pounds of marijuana into the U.S. Well, uh, certainly the border, which we're coming up to straight ahead, uh, has uh, become more challenging because of 9-11. Um, a uh, much stronger presence on the border to try and uh, stop uh, surface infiltration into the United States. After the smuggling charges against him were dropped, Patty Roberts worked with Brian Taylor for the marijuana party. How are you, Brian? Good, how are you, Patty? Not too bad. <laughs> All right, well, let me get my gear out of here. All right. These days, he serves as a self-styled marijuana consultant, making use of his inside knowledge. No, it's nice to show up at an airport where they don't shoot your tires out. The way Patty explains it, the key to the distribution network is the gatherer. They pay cash to the growers. So the growers aren't really aware that they're sending marijuana to the United States or to Alberta or to Eastern Canada. It may be two or 300 growers that provide their products and not knowing each other and not knowing who the exporter is. The gatherer buys product from various growers until he builds a load big enough to sell to what Patty calls an export corporation. There's probably at least a thousand people in BC gathering. They take away the need for the export corporation to know many different people, because the more people you know, the more risky life is. The distribution network is loosely organized, so by the time a shipment of marijuana approaches the border, no one really knows where it was grown or who collected the load. Even with all the beefed up enforcement, 80% of marijuana grown in Canada still ends up in the United States. And 15 billion American dollars flow back into Canada every year. BC bud marijuana coming out of Canada is, is the largest narcotic threat we have. The techniques that the smugglers have used has grown in sophistication over time. You're looking at very sophisticated compartments that are electronically controlled. At the Sumas port of entry, they had recently a cattle truck, which is a double-decker hauler. Both floors were hollowed out. That's a, that's a huge compartment accessed with hydraulic jacks, and they can even track them with GPS devices on their own loads. I think we know that if you increase the risks of doing business, in terms of both financial penalties and more significantly risks of incarceration. You're going to get a, a harder, tougher element of people involved in the game. Just like the Border Patrol, smugglers are upping the ante. Surveillance video from a joint U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, RCMP Sting, shows a helicopter owned by the U.N. 
a notorious Vancouver street gang. The investigation revealed how money from massive marijuana sales was used to purchase cocaine from a Mexican cartel in LA. The coke was smuggled back into Canada and sold on the streets of Vancouver. Because of tighter money laundering laws after 9-11, it's an easier transaction than cash. That takes away the entire benefit of the industry for British Columbians, because it's not cash that's coming back into our economy. That cocaine was taken out of the United States market far more efficiently than the Drug Enforcement Administration or any police force in the United States could do. People were coming down and buying it. Gradually, the entire industry is shifting from small-scale growers not in it only for the money to heavy-duty criminals playing for big stakes. If we're talking about volume, uh, then it is, you know, criminal motorcycle gangs, it is Vietnamese and Asian-dominated uh, organized crime groups in Canada and America. Organized crime is your largest producer. In Eastern Canada, First Nations are getting in on the action as well. With border access from native land in Ontario and Quebec, large volumes of pot are exported to the lucrative American market. Coming up, as the industry becomes more dangerous, small-time growers look to medical marijuana for salvation. If we had a regional distribution for medical marijuana, it could be 40 or 50 jobs, but it could also be a big tax uh, income for the province. It's midsummer in Grand Forks. The outdoor marijuana crops are thriving in the long days of intense sunlight. In his basement, the last thing Brian McAndrew wants to be doing is working under the searing heat of his lights. But two weeks before harvest, there's a big problem, one that could ruin his entire $12,000 crop. Got bugs. I don't want to use chemicals because uh, you don't want to be smoking that stuff and I don't trust it too much. Fed up with hiding from the law and fearing armed gangs, Brian has applied to Health Canada for a license to grow medical marijuana. He hopes his long career as an outlaw may soon be over. Brian Taylor has been licensed by Health Canada for seven years. He's convinced medical marijuana can transform the entire industry. As an anti-prohibitionist, I see great potential in people awakening to the medical use of cannabis. Who's a medical user and who's not is a is a real interesting question because you know, a lot of people will push that envelope as far as they can. Whoops. His Trip licensed grow-op has spin-off benefits for the local economy. He pays friends $25 an hour to help process his plants. A marijuana operation uh, could develop uh, because it's very labor-intensive. If we had a regional distribution for medical marijuana, it could be 40 or 50 jobs, but it could also be a big tax uh, income for the province. Health Canada limits the number of patients a grower can supply and the number of plants that can be grown. However, the rules aren't enforced too strictly. Three hours. <laughs> Will all that go to one patient? Many medical growers sell their surplus to a burgeoning gray market, compassion clubs, and dispensaries. They've sprung up across North America and supply patients suffering from many serious illnesses with a safe supply of medical cannabis. Though technically illegal in Canada, police usually look the other way, and politicians are reluctant to enter the legal quagmire compassion clubs present. They try to operate in a way where they're addressing the concerns of all the stakeholders, including the police and the general community and the medical establishment. And they're making sure that everybody that they supply has a doctor's confirmation of their diagnosis. Patricia, there's the legends. Lots of nice tops. Looks really nice. Thank you very much. Two and a half grams would be great. Although compassion clubs are non-profit, they're a rapidly expanding part of the marijuana economy. Yeah, so that's Thank awesome. you. Great. 13 American states now allow medical marijuana to be sold legally through dispensaries. 
Although U.S. federal law still prohibits marijuana, the Obama administration decided recently not to pursue arrests in states where compassion clubs are legal. In Canada, the number of medical users is on the rise. With baby boomers hitting middle age, an estimated one million people now use pot to relieve medical ailments. Less than 2% of them get their cannabis from compassion clubs. The other 98% use the black market. So for anyone supplying medical marijuana, there's plenty of potential for growth. $42 is your total. For some entrepreneurial growers, it's an opportunity to get in on the ground floor. This is a crash pole. If uh, somebody wants to try and crash the gates, they're going to run into spikes. Sam Malachi is a cancer survivor with a license to grow marijuana for his own use. We have guard dogs in here. Uh, we have the buildings fully alarmed, fully censored, fully monitored. Sam is also an ex-convict who's done hard time for extortion and cocaine trafficking. He has invested one and a half million dollars in what may be the most ambitious medical grow up in the country, just east of Vancouver. What you have in this room now, now you have your bud. And she's ready uh, to be clipped and trimmed now. Sam wants to be Canada's biggest supplier of medical marijuana. He dreams of building a network of grow ops right across the country, distributing his product through drugstores. Shoppers Drug Mart is Canada wide, from Newfoundland right to British Columbia. They have approximately 700 outlets. That's 700 pounds of marijuana a day. Even at $2,000 a pound, that's $1.4 million a day. A day. Part of Sam's plan is to hire existing growers as subcontractors, sharing the wealth. In a town like Grand Forks, I could make himself sufficient just by the growth of marijuana. If you're growing pot illegally, let's turn it to grow it legally, and we would be your purchaser. And in turn, we would be able to sell it now to the pharmaceutical companies. I happen to believe that the medical marijuana movement has become a kind of uh, Trojan horse uh, for legalization because um, medical marijuana really complicates the uh, environment for law enforcement. In Toronto, some medical growers find themselves caught in a revolving door of legal battles. Harassment. This is the fourth time, and I get away four times, and they're gonna pay for this. The fourth time, I guess. This is a federally licensed place. It took me years to obtain the license, and now the cops are trying to figure out what the legality of this is because they don't understand it themselves. With almost every grow up they raid, police find more plants than the grower's license allows. I guess they feel pretty confident that uh, the government and the courts are going to side with them, but that's what the courts are there for. It means that the limits on the number Yet at trial, the rights of medical growers and patients are usually upheld. Struck down as arbitrary as... Back in Grand Forks, it's election season, and Brian Taylor is taking yet another run at the mayor's office. My marijuana activism has been a, an issue in the past elections. You know, clearly, if I wasn't carrying that heavy weight of the marijuana baggage, it probably would have been mine to get uh, earlier than this. But attitudes are changing. The town's Economic Development Task Force is holding a forum about medical marijuana. Sam Malachi arrives, eager to pitch his business model for licensed grow ops to distribute marijuana through his corporate network. First up is Riel Kapler, explaining the risk taken by compassion clubs. It's civil disobedience, it's breaking the law, so not everybody's willing to stand up and break the law, but some people are, um, to make sure that people who are in need have access to high quality medicine. Then Sam Malachi presents his vision of how, in the future, licensed medical marijuana could help the local economy. Well, I just wanted, just wanted everybody to know that there is a legal federal program out there. I'm here tonight to speak to you and to offer Grand Forks my help in trying to build up your economy. Lofty dreams. 
But as harvest time approaches, the reality on the ground is far different. When I got to the corner of the greenhouse, uh, there were three men standing. They yelled, stop, don't move, and my, my feeling was that they were armed. It's early September. The outdoor marijuana is just starting to bud. It's harvest time for the RCMP. I'm late, so <laughs> don't want to leave the bird waiting. All over British Columbia, police take to the air, searching for stands of big, mature plants. Harlan spots one on Crown Land just east of Grand Forks. Um, OK, here it is right here on our uh, left, right there. Taylor knows the chopper won't see his crop. It's mostly a failure. Too much sun and not enough water during the recent heat wave. All that work, all that time, got these guys going so nice. Thought they were gonna get so big and then left them two days. More than I should have and it just, nothing. Things are looking up for Brian McAndrew. He saved his crop from bugs and now can reap his reward. Yeah, today's harvest day. Mm. Looking good, looking good. Don't see any bugs, nice and full. Mm. Smells good, sticky too. But across the valley at Brian Taylor's, the mood is much darker. Last night, the Ripper gang came calling. As I came out the door here, I, I wandered across to the greenhouse and when I got to the corner, there were three men standing they yelled, stop, don't move, and my feeling was that they were armed. I was so angry, I just started uh, moving towards them and yelling. They uh, turned around and ran across the field and through the fence. That night, I st it still sticks out in my head when that phone call came in from Brian. Just to hear the terror in his voice when he was calling for, for some help. The thieves stripped Brian of more than his crop. I live a very an open, trusting kind of lifestyle. And, uh, you know, I, I regret the loss of that. So it's election day here in Grand Forks, www.whatsupgf.com. <laughs> With a licensed medical grower running for mayor, the election is a barometer of the town's changing values. In the end, it isn't even close. Grand Forks has welcomed back the marijuana mayor. This is my fifth time running, so. And I think I got votes for tenacity. People just said, damn it, if he runs that many times, we're going to have to support him. But there was a change of community attitude towards him. And I think partly it's the medical marijuana movement that has moved people towards a better understanding of it. The new mayor. <laughs> Brian and Tammy are now part of that movement. They've got Ottawa's blessing to grow medical marijuana, so their next crop will be legal. It's nice to know uh, that what we're growing is not going to go to someone who's going to try and take it down to the States and trade it for Coke and do something like that. But the notion that old school growers can survive in the new marijuana economy by getting licensed may just be wishful thinking. I think that the idea, you know, that we will enter some kind of hippie paradise just isn't going to happen. Marijuana will be like any other industry dominated by the capitalists. Harland and his team zero in on a grow-op spotted from the air. When they eventually find it, the crop is much bigger than it looked from above. 500 plants worth half a million dollars. Once again, the ritual of clear-cutting another crop begins. We want to get these before they really have any economic value to anybody and just lay them down on the ground and give us more time to move on to the to the next guy. This season, the RCMP raid over 80 outdoor grow-ops in the Kootenays. 14,000 plants are destroyed. 
Ultimately, they're just small victories in a losing battle. This is a drop in a bucket for Grant Forks, let alone on the whole grand scheme of things. For Harland, harvest season is always frustrating. It seems like we're almost creating the, the wor worst atmosphere by uh, our laws and our enforcement and, uh, and our whole attitude towards this issue is like sort of creating the problem. <laughs> Taylor will salvage enough of his crop to scrape through the winter. If he plants again next year, the risks could be greater. The government is promising to crack down on illegal growers with harsher laws and mandatory jail time. We're very clear to the people who are in the business of destroying people's lives, the people who like to sell these things, who uh, think that the grow-op business is a great career opportunity, we send out a very clear message to them, you're going to jail if you get caught and convicted. In Grand Forks, the outdoor marijuana has all been harvested. Indoor growers are nurturing their winter crops. The Ripper Gang is still on the loose. The only thing that seems certain is that next year, it will all happen again.